Good morning, party people, and welcome to Camden, Maine. Uh, I'm up here attending a friend of mine's uh, uh, wedding anniversary and birthday party. I uh, timed it at the end of the season here, where it's just a little bit chilly, uh, but you get gorgeous fall colors. Uh, this is a waterfall that leads from a river down into the ocean. There's a little bay over here with a marina, and I'll shoot the next office hours uh, overlooking the marina, just because that's kind of pretty and cute. It's a, uh, been a fantastic trip up here. Did Sequel Saturday Boston, uh, then did a few days in Salem, Massachusetts with friends of ours for Halloween. Uh, and you saw the office hours over there at the graveyard. And uh, now we're finishing up on the end of the trip. We uh, will be here in, Cam in Camden for a few days and then we go back home to Vegas. So, and then we have another trip planned before my Black Friday sale starts, which is kind of bananas. All right, so let's go through your top voted question. The top voted question comes from Mike, who says, Hi Brent, you mentioned that there are two types of DBAs, production DBAs and development DBAs. Are recruiters and hiring managers familiar with the term development DBA, or would database developer be a more well-known title to use? In the year 2023, I don't think you can put that much faith in specific job titles. It's hard to sum up what a lot of us do in like two or three words. So you could use whatever title that you want, but you're probably gonna wanna tell the recruiter, look, I do lots of things with these databases. You name off whatever databases that they are. If you have a job come up in those database, databases, please feel free to send it to me and I'll tell you if I'm a good fit for that or not. Um, if you're trying to put a title on your resume that most closely met, <coughs> excuse me, I got terrible si sinus infection, I'm all clogged up. Uh, but if you're trying to put a, a job title on your resume that most closely matches what you do, Stick with whatever you're doing for the company. You know, put the closest description to what the company has as your job title, because I would never encourage folks to lie on their resume. Sooner or later, someone's going to call up to your current employer and say, hey, did so this person uh, work as a database reliability engineer during this time span? And you don't want the company to say no. Next up, let's see, I didn't click that button properly. Let's try that again. Hold on a second here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So next up we have, why is it not catching that? God dag nabbit, there it goes, okay, cool. Next up, Margaret asks, we're transitioning to SQL Server 2019, and we noticed that many queries that ran well on 2014 or 2016 are very slow. We've added a hint to our queries to force legacy cardinality estimation, but we're still not running at pre-upgrade speeds. Where else do we look? Oh, I love this question, because it has some really interesting answers. Okay, first off, you have to decide do you want to look at the whole server's performance all at once? Or do you want to look at one specific query? If you want to look at the whole server's performance all at once, start by looking at SP Blitz. Look at SP Blitz and compare the two servers. Maybe you missed a trace flag or a server level configuration from one server to the next. The next thing that you do is look at SP Blitz first with the parameter sense startup equals one. That'll tell you what the SQL Server's uh, wait stats are since startup. Then, based on whatever, and you're only gonna do this on the new one because it's the only current production server that you have. Based on whatever its top wait stats are, that's where you're gonna start your investigation. For example, say maybe that the new server is disk bottlenecked, that would lead me to ask things like, do we have all our memory configured correctly? Have we actually got max memory set right so that we can cache as much as possible? Uh, do we have storage weights that we've never seen before writing to disk? There can be all kinds of weights that are different from the old server to the new server. Now that can be tough if you weren't gathering any of that data on the old server. So that's where the second option comes in, looking at one query at a time. 
What you do is you take the old SQL Server, run a query with actual execution plans turned on, then run it on the new server with actual execution plans turned off and compare or turned on and compare the difference between the two. It may be that you're getting different execution plans, which then you get to start asking, all right, why are we getting different query plans? Did we maybe pop the database into a newer compatibility level and now we're getting different behavior? And I'll give you an example. Say you said you were going from 2014 or 2016 and now you're on 2019. If you're on Enterprise Edition and you pop the database into the current 2019 compatibility level, you can get batch mode execution plans on tables that don't have column store indexes in them. That can actually lead things to become worse if you're in something like an OLTP server, a transactional server. So hopefully that gives you the places to start. Either look at the server level by checking SP Blitz and then your wait stats, or look at the query level by comparing actual plans across the two servers. Next up, Matt asks, what's the best way to handle hierarchical data? Matt, that's an easy one. Hierarchy ID. Hierarchy ID is a data type designed for that. So then that way you can just use that. There's tons of documentation on it. It's been out there for, I don't know, seven, eight years, I think. I can't remember if it came out in like 2014. Might have even came back in 2012, come to think of it. Uh, but there's tons of examples out there on how to use it. Don't reinvent the wheel. Go with that. Uh, next up, Hanny asks, Hi Brent, SQL Server Enterprise Edition is $7,000 a core and standard is $2,000 a core. Is this an annual payment or a lifetime payment? Ah, this is the get in the door payment. This is your first payment, kind of like a down payment. Then going forward, you have to decide, do you want software assurance or not? Soft, software Assurance was originally designed to let you upgrade to the newest version of SQL Server all the time. These days it includes all kinds of other benefits like the ability to have a secondary server for high availability for free or a server where you run backups or check DB for free. All kinds of benefits are now, uh, vir there's virtualization benefits around Software Assurance. So that's the question you ask. If you find benefits in software assurance that you want, then there are additional annual payments that you make in order to get covered by software assurance. It's been a while since I looked at the specifics, but I want to say it was like 25 to 30 percent of your initial down payment, 25 to 30 percent every year going forward after that to get those perks from software assurance. If you decide that you never want to upgrade SQL Server and you don't need the software assurance benefits, then that seven or two thousand bucks is all you pay per core. Next up, Montro asks, Hi Brent, can you make another post about the questions you didn't want to answer online? I will, but only when if I'm in the situation where a ton of questions pile up that are highly voted that I don't want to answer. I'll tell you what, I get all kinds of questions that I don't want to answer that no one upvotes. And in those cases, they just don't make the cut because I clear out the questions periodically uh, and then let people start in again just to keep the list of questions kind of short. Next up, let's see here. I'm going past a few because I'm going to do a speed round of office hours here in a while. And there's some that are really simple and short, straightforward. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, Alma asks, what is your opinion of database sharding? Sharding is a technique where you have a bunch of database servers, not databases, a bunch of database servers, and different clients live on different database servers or different users live on different database servers. I like sharding when you're at a truly like global scale, when you're at say five terabytes of transactional data, you can get faster response time by breaking that data across multiple servers. But there are a couple of problems with that. One is that your application needs to know which SQL server to connect to 
It is not going to connect into one SQL Server, execute a query, and then the SQL Server will automatically gather the data from wherever it lives. That's not sharding. That's a single point of failure. That's a mess for things like linked servers, and performance will get worse, not better. That's the first problem, is your application has to know where the data lives and connect to it to issue the queries. The second problem is reporting, because your managers are going to want consolidated reporting across the data that lives on all the database servers. So it's going to be up to you to build some kind of centralization process, because you really don't want to be doing things like linked server queries in order to do those big, ugly reports. Because of those two things, because both of those involve human effort, like you and I have to solve those problems and make changes to the application and to the reports in order to do it, it's generally more effective to just scale up the SQL Server when you're dealing with relatively small amounts of data. And I'm going to say under 5 terabytes for me is relatively small compared to cracking the nut of sharding. Sharding's awesome. I love it. It's just not easy, nor is it free. Next up, let's see here. Where did I? I lost myself in my big old screen. Um, next up, uh, do, 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 all kinds of them are going to have really short answers, so it's uh, going to be interesting. Um, oh, whoa, 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 consultant wannabe says, Hey Brent, what's the most common issue you find when consulting with clients? Things that make you think, really, come on, it's 2023, why are you still doing that? This one's easy, far and away, not even close, backups. It's the year 2023. Why are people not automatically testing their backups? Why haven't people used a script like SP Database Restore? If you use any kind of third-party backup software, they all have automation built in to do this. Why are you not restoring your backups every day, testing them on another server with something like CheckDB, and reporting back in? You would not believe the number of times that I get involved with a client and I do something as simple as run SP Blitz, and there are urgent warnings about databases that haven't been backed up. And they say, your script must be wrong. And I go, okay, let's go pop open your backups, and let's go take a look at the last time they succeeded. This is so true, it happened again like two weeks ago, where I was working with a client, it was the first thing that we look at, and I just asked the innocent question of, why aren't your backups working? And the person got all defensive, like, it's got to be some kind of mistake. The mistake is that you weren't testing your backups. And I don't mean manually, I mean automated. This is too important for you to just make a post-it note on the side of your monitor that you're going to do it again next Tuesday, because you're not going to actually do it. Uh, next up, John Kurt says, our architects suggest read scale with always on availability groups. Is what is your experience of this and is it something that we should be aware of? When this feature came out, uh, I remember reading about it and looking at the documentation really briefly and going, this will never work. I gotta be honest though, it's been a long time since I looked at that documentation, so I can't tell you what the specifics were. I can tell you I haven't seen anyone using it, but I don't know that that means nobody's using it. Because it was such a niche feature that I was like, I don't understand what, how this is going to solve a problem here. Remember that you have to license all of these servers with Enterprise Edition. Generally, when I see people throwing in a whole herd of pizza boxes, uh, trying to solve a problem with Enterprise Edition, and we run the numbers, usually it's much simpler to say, why don't you just have one server and make it beefier? Now, granted, that's single point of failure. There are all kinds of problems with that as well. But generally for reporting, you don't want to scale together a whole bunch of turkeys and think that you're going to have an eagle. That's not how scale out works. All right, so that's a good round of questions for the morning. I am going to probably sit here for a little while and 
watch this delightful little waterfall. Uh, there's all kinds of history here behind Camden and that uh, the river and the waterfall here. The, uh, they used to build ships here. They use this for powering grain mills. There's all kinds of neat history over here on the, the uh, coast of Massachusetts and Maine. It's a really pretty area, especially this time of year with uh, watching colors change. I'm red-green colorblind, so I don't appreciate the, uh, the leaves changing as much as probably most of y'all do. One of these days I'll have to do a blog post about the kind of color blindness that I have and show you there are these really great color blindness simulation apps where you can show a picture of what it really looks like and a picture of what it looks like for me. And people are always shocked because, you know, when you put them side by side, to me they're the same picture because I, I just see a muted version of reds and greens. And everyone's always shocked. They're like, oh my God, that's all you see? I feel so sorry for you. And I'm like, my life is not that bad. You know, today, the, of course, the sun's a little muted, so the colors don't pop as much as they should. But still, it's not a bad view to sit and look at. Thanks a lot for hanging out with me, and I will see you all at the next office hours. Adios.